Good morning and welcome to a very special video because today I have with me a very special guest. So would you mind introducing yourself? Yes, my name is Robert Llewellyn and I am the founder and one of the hosts of the Fully Charged Show. And now, uh, what was it that you said recently about electric cars in Norway? Can you just talk us through it? 94.3% of all car sales in Norway are 100% electric. Ah, no problem. And as a country, uh, what is the primary source of finance in, in Norway? We've discussed the fact that the Norwegian government is able to do this because of the vast income they receive from exporting oil and gas. So in some ways, we in the UK are helping pay for all these electric vehicles. Yeah, the Norwegian government export quite a lot of oil and gas, actually, making them quite a wealthy nation. Um, I've got a few more facts about Norway. Did you know that the average income in Norway is 637,000 Norwegian kroner, which equates to almost 46,000 pounds. Nice. And I suppose that makes sense because EVs, well, they're quite expensive. Uh, so we've got a rich nation with a high average wage. And, and I wonder how they're doing on, on poverty in Norway. Should we take a look? Interestingly, no. Well, you are right, actually, Robert. Norway has a poverty rate of 0%, um, or at least that's what the figures show. 0% uh, in 2021, 0% in 2020, and 0.05% in 2019. So not only is Norway a small and wealthy country, but it's also a country that, that's improving. Things are getting better in Norway. Hopefully one day we'll stop Norway. So shall we just compare that um, to the United Kingdom? Well, the average UK salary is around about £35,000, and the people that can do maths uh, have already worked out that that's £11,000 less than Norway. And the poverty rate in the UK, remember, it was 0% in Norway. Um, well, in the UK, we are a developed nation, but the poverty rate in the UK is 22%. This year? That's right. In a country of almost 67 million people, almost 15 million people here in Britain live in, in poverty. Uh, what's the population of Norway? Basically, they are smaller. It's 5.45 million. So just to get this straight, you're celebrating the fact that Norway just surpassed 93% of new cars being electric, while the amount of people living in poverty in the UK is greater than three times the whole population of Norway. Uh, it seems to be resulting in a bit of a boom time. Actually, that gets better, because if we stop to think of the children, uh, apparently 29% of children in the UK live in poverty. That means that there are more children living in poverty in the United Kingdom than there are people, human beings, in Norway. Nice. So that could be something to do with why they're buying so many electric vehicles. But don't take my word for it. Let's take the word of someone who commented on the fully charged video. The main reason, he types, EVs are such a success here in Norway isn't that we make billions from selling, making, and selling, and making, and selling oil, it's that we have ridiculously high taxes on fossil fuel cars. So an electric car without taxes, as they are tax-free below 50,000 euros, appears reasonably priced. Second important reason is that charger networks are all over the place here. You don't need to plan your trip. Whenever you need a break, there's a charger close by. And the last reason, and this is probably the most important one, um, most Norwegians own their own house or apartment. So most Norwegians can install their own home charger outside their house or parking lot. Uh, remember, poverty rate, 22% in the United Kingdom. Uh, and that means 22% of the United Kingdom are absolutely not going to buy a £50,000 electric car. Next story. From now on, I will be scouring the news for more information about African-built electric vehicles. And if you know anything about other countries in Africa that are making electric ground transport, and I know it's happening, I've spoken to many people from that area, please let me know. Mm. Well, okay, yes, I think you have missed a bit of a big one here because a huge part of the electric car industry is already based in Africa. Look, I'll show you, here it is. This is an industrial cobalt mine where there's not supposed to be one artisanal miner. Now that's the term used for people who are just digging by hand as opposed to tractors and excavators. And if you like zoom in, you'll see that amongst that sea of humanity, there are thousands of kids. But there's not enough cobalt outside of the Congo to meet demand, primarily being driven by adoption of electric vehicles, which is a net good thing, except for the people in the Congo. 
So if we ignore the complete destruction of a gigantic part of Africa and child slavery and all of that sort of stuff, should we talk about something positive? In this year, 2024, there has already been more renewable energy generation capacity installed and linked to the grid in China than the entire UK can generate at peak time. Hey, that does sound good. Uh, do they have a good track record on looking after their own citizens and looking after the environment and not doing too much polluting? Uh, no, not so much. China contributes a 30% to global pollution, which is twice that of the USA. And not only that, the 30% of pollution that China produces comes from just four provinces. So imagine how bad the pollution is going to be when the EV movement really gets going, considering China are in the process of wiping out the European car manufacturers with their cheaper, lower quality alternatives. Uh, to be fair to China, though, if we concentrate just on air pollution, China aren't even in the top 10. Um, then the UK? Well, I found a graph that listed 192 countries with worse air quality than the United Kingdom. Yep, for air pollution, the UK performs even worse than we do in the Eurovision Song Contest. We're in 193rd place. So, uh, breathe it in, I guess. What do you want to talk about next? Fire engines. Oh, okay, no problem, we can do fire engines. Um, do you want to tell me about what's going on in Germany? Berlin now has the world's largest fleet of 100% battery electric fire engines made by the Austrian fire equipment supplier Rosenbauer. Did you know Rosenbauer are part owned by Piera Industry AG, who also own KTM and Gas Gas and Husqvarna? Well, Never mind. You mentioned Berlin. Uh, is this the same Berlin that recently banned electric vehicles from multi-storey car parks due to the fire risk? So can we pretend we've spent slightly less? I think it is. So you can't park your EV in a multi-storey car park just in case it catches fire. And if your combustion car catches fire in the car park, then the fire engine isn't allowed in either. Double win. What's next? Whatever opinion you or I or anyone has about batteries right now, will be out of date right now. Okay, so you're saying that battery technology develops so fast that we just don't know what the next development is going to bring. That might explain the hesitancy in the second-hand market when it comes to buying a used electric vehicle. Why would anyone spend tens of thousands of pounds on technology that may be, what did you say? Out of date. Right now. Samsung revealed that its pilot solid-state battery production line is fully operational. Oh, Samsung. Do you mean Samsung as in exploding batteries? Samsung as in lawsuit in 2024 about batteries. Samsung as in fine 10 million pound in Europe for building in planned obsolescence to their products. Class action lawsuit for misleading customers on speed and performance of products. That's Samsung? Oh, good. Ask them to bring back flip phones, please. I really like mine back. Anything else? Due to their higher production costs, these batteries' initial application will be limited to the super premium EV segment. Ah, super premium EVs. Yeah, go on then, let's do that one. Uh, Porsche Taycan, £120,000 when it was new. Last night, I found one on Auto Trader. It had £20,000 of additional options on it at the dealer. That's £140,000 for that car. And 74,000 miles later, how much money is it? 37 grand. That means it's lost 100,000 pounds. That's like, I'd call that the majority. It's 25,000 pounds every year for four years. Uh, that makes it a great second-hand buy. That does make it a bargain if you've got £37,000 to spend on a car, if you're not living in abject poverty, that is. But I do feel sorry for the sucker who bought that brand new and lost all that money, although due to government incentives, that was probably subsidised by the taxpayer. Meanwhile, the latest combustion engines remain virtually identical to a combustion engine from 40 years ago. Ah, actually, on this one, you couldn't be more wrong. 40 years ago, we were only just introducing catalytic converters, and cars were getting cleaner and greener just by the nature of development. 40 years ago, manufacturers had just got the reliability in the bag and were beginning to work on fuel economy and safety. By the late 1990s and early 2000s, we had diesel cars that could easily achieve 50 miles per gallon. Cars like the Audi A2 that pushed the boundaries on what was capable with diesel technology. And 80 miles per gallon on a daily basis for your normal everyday car was well within sight. The problem was the government doesn't really have any interest in allowing us to drive around in cars that we can actually afford to run. Uh, legislation changed and that's why modern cars 
feel like such a step backwards in running costs. And I know I've mentioned this on the channel before, but my 1996 Volvo 850 diesel, a large family car of the time, will average close to 60 miles per gallon on a run, while the planet-saving, lower-tax, government-incentivized modern equivalent that my good friend has as a company car rarely cracks 30 miles per gallon. So modern cars are using twice as much fuel as older cars, even though we laud them as being environmentally better. And you may have heard uh, on a recent Fully Charged Show podcast I recorded with Jim Farley, the CEO of Ford. Who I try my best not to listen, uh, but isn't he the guy who's always knocking on the door of 10 Downing Street asking for some help to sell his cars because he's completely destroyed the model lineup and hasn't actually got anything in the showroom that anyone wants to buy since he killed the Ford Fiesta? And I think it's important to just to remind ourselves that the sales of the F-150 Lightning pickup truck and the Mustang Mach-E are a very close second to the Tesla Model 3 in the USA. They are selling trainloads of electric cars. Well, no, they're not. Let me read you this one. Ford will cut weekly production of the F-150 Lightning in response to slowing demand. The automaker is telling dealers to expect on average 1,600 trucks per week in 2024, where the factory has capacity to make 3,200. Ford recently said it would delay $12 billion in investments, and that includes pausing construction of one of its two planned battery plants in Kentucky and reducing production goals for another battery factory in Michigan. Ford continues to lose money on its EVs, around $1.3 billion this last quarter in adjusted earnings. So far this year, Ford has lost $3.1 billion on its EV spending and has said it's going to lose a total of $4 billion this year. He knows how the automotive industry works, let's just put it there. Looking good. Or... We could talk about Fiat, who stopped production of the electric Fiat 500 a month ago because nobody's buying it. They decided to pause production for a little while, wait for demand to catch up with supply, and they've just announced today, actually, in the news, that they're going to hold fire on making the electric Fiat 500 for another month to try and... I, I guess the uh, demand is just lagging quite far behind supply in the race to net zero. In a statement to trade unions, Stellantis described the European electric car market as being in deep trouble as a result of the global slowdown in EV sales. Um, additionally, Stellantis has announced plans to begin production of a new 500 hybrid model in early 2026 as it looks to diversify its vehicle output. So, if you live in one of the wealthiest countries in the world, um, not this one, this is a third world nation with 22% poverty, but if you live in Norway, go and get yourself an EV. It'll be great. Anywhere else, probably not. Anyway, you've been away on a road trip, haven't you? Tell me about your road trip. I got this offer from BMW. Do you want to use this car? And it is, was a, it was a treat. <laughs> it was unexpected. And so I said, yes, please, rather rapidly. And uh, the, the car arrived yesterday. <laughs> you got a free car, a free car. Nice, from a manufacturer. I can't imagine they want anything in return though, do they? Uh, anyway, how is it? 300 plus mile range uh, on an auto route like this. I'm traveling at 115 kilometers an hour. 300 miles of usable range? Well, I'd hope so, because in M Sport spec, that's a 76,000 pounds car before options. There are variants of this car. This is the absolute top of the range. It is about a hundred thousand pounds, so about a hundred and thirty thousand euros. A hundred grand for a family estate car. Do we really need to say anything else in this video? Well, we're going to. So go on, carry on. So uh, charge four times, as I've said before. We had, and the total of that was £85.41. pence. That's what it cost to drive 989 miles, basically. Uh, uh, that is three Tesla superchargers and one Ionity charger. Hang on a minute, right? You fueled up four times and it cost you £85, so you did 918 miles. Firstly, well, we know that the cost of electric and, and the network actually in Europe is better. Uh, so it'd be even worse if you're in the UK. But the cost of electric is subsidised. Secondly, that's four stops. In a BMW 5 Series diesel touring, you could have done it in one stop. Let me guess, right? Let me guess. You're now going to compare your £100,000 electric 5 Series with a totally inappropriate vehicle. Um, 
and I've worked out now, I had to Google it, uh, uh, to how much a BMW uh, i5 with a turbocharged V8 hybrid uses. Brilliant, you did. You chose a V8 petrol. Superb. And this is so according to BMW's figures, not some randomer, definitely the, the official figures, it would, it would cost £247.25 in petrol. So we've gone completely backwards. Hold on a minute, look what I found. Here is a 2015 BMW 520Ds or luxury touring auto Euro 6 that will achieve 67 miles to the gallon on a run. Now, if we assume that fuel is £1.36, which it is in the UK at the moment, although it's cheaper in Europe, that car can do 918 miles on, wait for it, £85.26, 26 pence more than your £100,000 brand new electric five series. Also, uh, the diesel's got a 70 litre tank, and if you're managing the higher end of the fuel consumption, you'll do that entire journey on one tank and have fuel to spare. So let's just summarize. Instead of giving long distance BMW drivers a sensible two litre diesel, we're now putting them in 100,000 pound cars and subsidizing the running costs as they go, which is brilliant. Uh, I guess all there is to say is thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed that. Please do subscribe. Hang on a minute, I'm not finished. Uh, I just ran some more numbers. My small channel only has 142 thousand subscribers but the fully charged fully financed by the government show has one million subscribers and yet your video was only viewed by 89,000 people my channel has only 142,000 subscribers uh, and my video managed 29,000 views that means that only nine percent of your audience turned up to watch your video uh, but on my small channel it was 20 percent so I guess that's number one. Okay, virtually no one is buying electric vehicles, and in 10 years, there will be so few electric vehicles, they won't register on the graph. Nice. So can we pretend we've spent slightly less? And wouldn't it be great if African shed the burden of combustion vehicles altogether and hop straight to electric cars? Aren't they a lovely bunch of people? But you know, I've never heard of them before. I've just checked today. The only thing there was a chicken farm a technology that has transformed their economies. And that's all they're good for. I just thought I'd mention it. So here's another example of a vehicle that electric transport skeptics would be sure would never be electric. Chicken trucks. Berlin now has the world's largest fleet of 100% battery electric chicken trucks. Uh, it seems to be resulting in a bit of a boom time. That was it, everywhere. And I'm talking from experience. Uh, they had a monopoly down under. But interestingly, Ford are currently converting one of their biggest plants in Mexico to another chicken farm. And I think it's important to just to remind ourselves that the sales of the chicken trucks, they are selling train loads of electric chicken trucks. Anyway, that's enough. <laughs> <laughs>